Hello, and welcome to Book Break for Greece Public Library. I am Kirstra. I'm one of the librarians here, and I moderate our Pints and Prose book discussion group. And I am joined, as always, by my fellow reader, Claire. Claire. <laughs> Hi, Kirstra. <laughs> Thanks. I moderate the Historical Fiction Book Group on Facebook and also as the page turns here at the library. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And today, as we are ringing in February, uh, you know, Valentine's season, whether you get jazzed about Valentine's or not, it's a great time to talk about pears. That's right. Right? And of course, that's what our challenge is all, all about. It just so happens. So I think, Claire, you have a copy of our of our little graphic. So our reading challenge this winter for adults and teens is perfect pairing. Perfect pairs, which we <laughs> may have chosen for the very perfect little pairs with the faces on. Yes, absolutely. So we talked a little bit about the challenge last time, but just to run over again real quick how it works, um, we are asking everyone who participates to read pairs of books. So these are books usually one fiction and one nonfiction that are linked by some kind of common theme. Um, and today, Claire and I have both brought a few pairs to talk about. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about why it's good to read nonfiction. Oh, because my gosh. Because I think yes. some people are just naturally intimidated when they mm -hmm. hear the word nonfiction. And um, I found something that said, A, you're going to learn valuable life lessons just because it's it's it you absorb it more when you're reading about real people mm -hmm. um your concentration is going to improve um memory and analytical skills so awesome. there you go and you're supposedly supposed to be a better communicator so we'll Ooh. find out you know yes you can tell us how well we're communicating at the end of this challenge that's right <laughs> um but yeah and you know as both claire and i read a lot of fiction sometimes we find ourselves thinking like, you know, about a historical fiction. This is such a cool setting. I wonder if that's how it really happened, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes reading fiction about a certain theme or topic can just spark your mind and spark your curiosity to learn more about the world around you. I really like when I read a good historical fiction, um, when the author has good notes in mm -hmm. the back. That is something that often springboards me into you know, what really happened. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes you read a nonfiction that seems like it could be fiction, mm -hmm. like too strange to be true. And that can be fun too. And then pairing it with how authors reimagine those real world events to bring them to readers. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's a lot of us talking about read pairs of books. <laughs> it's good for you. Eat your vegetables. <laughs> and not only that, when you fill in your little form, mm -hmm. just telling why you read the book um, and why you paired them, mm -hmm. at the end, we're going to be doing some prize drawings. So absolutely more incentive. Yeah. And we love hearing about what you guys think about the books that you're reading and why you might have put two books together that maybe somebody else wouldn't have. We've already received a couple of submissions for this challenge. And if you follow us on Facebook, you may have noticed we've been, um, or we have posted at least once, and we hope to do more, um, some quotes from you all who have submitted books about why you paired the books together and what you got out of that pairing. Because Kirsten and I are book nerds, and we want yeah. other people to be book nerds too. Yes. It makes us feel better about ourselves. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Book nerd for life. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think we've both got a pair where we've read both books. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got a couple of pairs where we have read one and then picked another book to pair with it, right? Yes. All I right. Think so uh, what would you like to start with? Oh, I will start with the one I read. Okay. Um, the first one, my nonfiction one, is Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. <laughs> Hold it up higher so that we can see it in the frame. <laughs> okay. Still learning our new technology. Absolutely. Excuse me. <laughs> okay, so this one is Emmanuel Echo. Um, he started, I believe, with a podcast, and then he went on to, to put this in a book. But basically, it is taking people's misconceptions or as he puts it 
how uh, he encourages all his white friends to start the uncomfortable conversation. And he has basic questions that people want to ask but have been afraid to ask um, and puts it in the book. And a lot of it is just how black men, particularly in society, are treated. Um, It was an interesting eye-opening book for me. Um, Some parts I liked better than others. But I paired it with... A Good Neighborhood by Therese Ann Fowler. And this book was really interesting um, because it was set in a pretty affluent neighborhood in North Carolina. And it was a biracial couple that had the house. The, The husband who was white died. So you have black mom raising her biracial son. Um, and just the implications for him for being black and mm-hmm. how she worried about that and the way people are treated in society. So even though he was um, a great scholar, he was very musically talented, he had a scholarship to a school, they had a neighbor move into the neighborhood who actually um, blasted down several older homes and built what I would call like a McMansion. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was a big HVAC guy and he moves in with his family they're white, and Valerie is the mom. She's an ecologist and feels very strongly about the old trees and stuff in their neighborhood, so they start bickering, which starts to accelerate. And, of course, he has a daughter that's about the same age as Uh her son, so you can see where this is going. (laughs) And it's kind of written in a Greek tragedy format, and then, unfortunately, the the tragedy occurs to Xavier. But... Mm. um, Seems very realistic, though. And then after reading, you know, the other book with uncomfortable conversations with a black man, you begin to see some of the things where, you know, the instant perception makes things very difficult for mm-hmm. for them. So that was it. Was a good one. It was um, definitely. We read the book um, "A Good Neighborhood" in "As the Page Turns" just and recently, right? Yes, just fairly recently. It might have been December, and I, that's actually the second time I read the book, and I liked it even better the second time hmm. I read it. So, um, yeah, so that's where I'm starting with my first one. Nice. So I like it. I that's an an interesting pairing. Yeah, I like it. Um, so I'll start with my pair where I've read both books. Um, so the first one, I'm going to start with the fiction, which is um, Miracle Creek by Angie Kim. Um, this may look familiar. It was our Grease Reads selection last year. So we had um, the author Angie Kim join us via Zoom to do a conversation about the book, which was awesome. Angie Kim was great. Um, and I encourage everyone to register for this year's Grease Reads, which is coming up in March. Just plugging, <laughs> shamelessly log rolling. Uh, so Miracle Creek is a courtroom drama, and it's also an immigrant story, I would say. So the family at the center is um, a Korean immigrant family. They live in the suburbs of Virginia, and they run a business that they call Miracle Submarine. And it's a hyperbaric chamber. And the hyperbaric chamber can be used to treat a variety of illnesses and ailments. And there is, unfortunately, a tragedy that occurs in the submarine at the very beginning of the book. And then we have the courtroom drama that unfolds as everyone tries to figure out what happened and who was at fault. Um, But like I said, the family that runs the business is a Korean immigrant family. And that is so that immigrant experience and particularly the Korean cultural experience is what made me pair it with Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner. So this is a memoir that came out um, towards the end of last year. So still pretty recent. Uh, Michelle Zahner you may or may not know as the musician behind the band Japanese Breakfast. I am not familiar with this band, but apparently they exist and they're pretty cool. Um, But Michelle is the child of an American father and a Korean mother. She grew, she was born in Seoul, but grew up in Eugene, Oregon. And this book is a memoir of her relationship with her mother. Um, Her mother was 
diagnosed with terminal cancer when the author was 25. So we get a little bit of Michelle's childhood, and then there's this diagnosis, which is, you know, the big disruption in her life. And then the rest of the book is talking about um, caretaking and trying to sort of, like, pack into that last time, you know, a whole lifetime's worth of experiences and the grief after her mother dies. And woven through this whole thing is Korean culture and specifically Korean food, which is how she and her mother really connected. And um, as a person whose family puts a lot of emphasis on food as love, (laughs) um, I related to a lot of that and how sort of, you know, the smell of a particular food will bring her back to her mother and learning how to cook some of these Korean foods that she never learned to cook when her mother was alive. She kind of dives into learning how to cook afterwards, after her mother dies, how that kind of helps her to um, process her grief and still feel that emotional connection to her mother after her mother is gone. So Korean culture, lots of food, Um, I really want some bibimbap now and some kimchi, so I may have to find a Korean place for dinner tonight. (laughs) But um, it was really a very lovely memoir. Sad, um, but very well written. And um, yeah. That one's been on a lot of lists as Mm -hmm. it's on my to be read list. I know my daughter read it and Mm -hmm. really liked it because as you know, she's like the big cook, but she and I read, I'm going to jump on your parade, yeah. okay, and talk about um, that book would also pair very, very well with the last story of Mina Lee, mm-hmm. um, also a Korean story, but it's a Korean mother and daughter set in Los Angeles, and mom is pretty much hanging on to the traditions, they mm-hmm. live in like Koreatown mm-hmm. in that city, and um, daughter is trying to push all of that away. She's gone up to, I believe, it might have been Portland or Seattle. Um, can't get in touch with her mom. Finds out her mom has died. Mm. And then she is going back on this journey and realizing how little she knew about her mom, but also that tying in with the food. Mm-hmm. You know, they both had that. So, yeah, I'd highly recommend that. And I'm very jealous because now I want to read that book, too. So Yeah, absolutely. I listened to it on Libby, um, and the author reads it. And I'm such a huge fan of authors reading their own memoirs. Um, I think you get a little bit more mm-hmm. with that. You get more of the, the tone and the feeling right behind it. More of the emotion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Speaking of emotion, <laughs> I'm going to jump in with my one that I... I've talked about this one before. My Last Continent. You know... Everyone knows I I don't typically do romance, but this one was so different. I um, was really drawn to it. It's two scientists that are in Antarctica, and they make this journey several times a year to go and study the penguins. Of course, they fall in love. It is not the Hallmark movie kind of romance, so you're not going to have that neat, tied up in a little bow kind of tidy. But it was just so good. And just the third character in there, you have like the the two researchers, but Antarctica itself plays a huge role in this story just because of where they are and what they're doing. Um, So that's what makes it really memorable for me. And I want to pair it with my penguin year, (laughs) which is Life (laughs) Among the Emperors. And it's by Lindsay McRae. This one is is a photojournalist that actually was assigned to go to Antarctica. And there are pictures, um, really, really cute pictures in here. That's why I can't listen to this one. (laughs) Both of these are available on Hoopla. Okay. Um, My Last Continent is an audiobook. And since I've already read it before, I think I'm going to listen to it this time and see what I think of it. And then um, I'm going to read the one, like, So you're not going to be able to check this out, people. (laughs) I've got it. Um, You're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait. But then it might be worth the wait. But um, 
Yeah, so just learning how brutal that climate is and what you have to do to study. Look look at this little seal. Look at the little oh. seal, people. So, so cute. Yeah, and then, um, you know, just what these animals do to survive. I, I think in addition to memoirs, I love a good animal story. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like one of my favorite things to read as far as nonfiction. So especially if we're doing something to, to help them keep going. So Nice. Yeah. Um, all right, I am going to uh, change tack completely, and now for something completely different. Um, so my next one, um, I have read the fiction half of my pair, and that is The Hunger by Amakatsu. Um, so The Hunger is historical fiction. Um, it is a fictionalized take on the Donner Party. Oh, you upbeat girl, you. <laughs> um, and just, you know, as if the whole situation of the Donner Party wasn't bad enough, um, something is attacking the party on the trail to the west and um, killing members of the party, and they don't know what it is. But there does seem to be something maybe supernatural going on. Okay. So that's our horror element to The Hunger. Um, it's a very dark book, <laughs> not gonna lie, uh, not gonna sugarcoat it, um, but really well written. I actually read it at the beginning of quarantine or <laughs> pandemic and I was like, why am I doing this to myself? Um, but it was so good, I couldn't actually put it down, even though the subject matter was questionable. Um, so I would pair that book with this one, which is The Best Land Under Heaven, The Donner Party in the Age of Manifest Destiny by Michael Wallace. So this is an actual historical look at the Donner Party, um, why they got into the mess that they did, what exactly happened, and according to the flyleaf of this book, um, it includes research from many new documents that have not been um, written about previously. Mm -hmm. So some new insights into the Donner Party. Um, and I'm, you know, dark like that. So I find this stuff fascinating. <laughs> like, I want to know. Um, I want to know what happened and, you know, how they got to the point where they were eating each other yeah, while yeah. they were stranded in the mountains. You just had to come right out and say it, Well, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. the point of the Donner Party. Otherwise, no one would care. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still traumatized. There was a song that came out when I was little about people that, I think it was called Timothy. It was like, I, I, it just did it in for me. I, I was remember, it about the yeah. Donner Party or I just about cannibalism? I my big brother, are they talking about eating each other? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I digress. Well, different strokes for different strokes. Exactly. And I bet you're going to lighten it up a little oh, bit. Oh, I am. I'm <laughs> going right back to, okay. I think this one, I've read the nonfiction. Mm -hmm. I was going to talk about another nonfiction book, but I hated it so much. I really didn't feel like I could bring it here. So the guy was just so pretentious. I was just. Well, the next time we do a segment on books we hated, you can talk about that one. You got it. It's on my list. Why don't you just read the title in the this one is Behind the Scenes, or 30 Years a Slave, and Four Years in the White House. It's by mm. Elizabeth Keckley, um, and she was in the White House with the Lincolns. She was Mrs. Mm. Lincoln's dressmaker. And when this book came out, it was considered a bombshell. You know, a oh, lot of bad. people, A, could not believe that Keckley, who was a black woman, wrote this book. They felt it was a betrayal to the friendship of Mrs. Lincoln. It, of course, completely destroyed their friendship. Um, but on the other hand, a lot of historians have actually used this document. So even though, oh, and Mrs. Todd's son, one remaining son, actually squashed the publication and, you know, people Seems buying about it. right. Yes. So... Um, it was not a success when it was first published, but it has gone down in history to be a very accurate portrayal of the Lincolns in the White House mm. and the friendship between Mrs. Lincoln and Miss Keckley. Miss Lincoln was um, Mary Todd Lincoln. She was something. Uh, $27,000 in debt. <laughs> that would be a lot today. Oh, yeah, that's like over a million dollars today, I believe. Um, I actually looked it up, but... 
I don't remember the number now. But um, uh, and Abe knew nothing about that. She also uh, took, you know, gifts and things to, and then helped people get appointments in the cabinet. Oh, so there's, there's so, you a, know, a little bit of grift on the side. Just just <laughs> a little, you know. She she kind of had her quirks. That's for darn sure. Um, but anyway. This is called Mrs. Lincoln's Dressmaker, and this is a fictionalized version of Mary Todd Lincoln and Elizabeth Keckley. So I have not read this yet. I'm hoping it's good. Um, it's been super popular. Yeah, it's been very popular, but uh, it it's going to be hard to see how it can really expand upon some of the real-life things that I read in the other one that I just had no idea that she did. I know mm -hmm. that... You know, she had a lot of, probably by today's standards, would be mental illness issues. Um, I even wonder if her shopaholicism was, was something like bipolar. Mm -hmm. I mean, who knows? But um, they lost some children. So in mm -hmm. some ways, you have to cut Mary Todd some slack just because she did lose a lot, you know. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to try and read that one and have that one be one of my pairs. So Nice. Um, I would also just do a shout out digression just for a moment. Um, if you are interested in the Lincoln presidency, I would highly recommend if you're ever in DC making a visit to the Lincoln Cottage, um, which is not very well known. Um, he had sort of a, a country house, mm -hmm. what was then in the country, but was actually like three miles up North Capitol Avenue from the White House, or from the Capitol, um, w in what is now Northeast D.C., in just like a residential neighborhood, there's the house where he went to get away from like the summer heat in D.C., um, and it's cool. They've got all kinds of exhibits. It's, it's a historic house museum, but it's really cool, and not a lot of people know about it, so. It's like Camp David before Camp David. Yeah, absolutely. So, cool. Um, all right, so this works out well because my last one, I've read the fi the nonfiction and not the fiction. Okay. So my nonfiction is Hidden Figures by Margot Lee Shatterley. Um, and I think most people will be familiar with the movie that came out a few years ago with uh, Viola Davis and um, Octavia Spencer and other people who I'm sure I'm forgetting, um, Kevin Costner. There you go. So Hidden Figures is the true story of um, a group of women, largely black women, who worked for NASA during the space race as human calculators. So they were actually performing the math and performing the calculations that allowed the moon landing to happen, which is like mind-blowing, especially for someone who carries around a computer in her pocket all day, right? Yeah. Like you hear the word computer and you think like computer, but the original computers were these women who were, you know, highly trained mathematicians and they just did this math in their head all day, which is crazy. Um, so it's a fascinating story. It is, um, so our main figures of our hidden figures are Katherine Johnson, um, Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, and Christine Darden, um, some of whom carried on working for NASA for years. Um, I believe it was Dorothy Vaughn was one of the premier um, computer programmers at the beginning of having computers <laughs> to do this kind of work. Um, and it was amazing. So they were you know, up against gender stereotypes and race stereotypes working at a time when, um, you know, after World War II, when a lot of women got punted out of the workforce. Um, but these women had such specialized skills that they made careers for themselves and were essential contributors to the space program, which is very cool. So to pair with that, I have The Calculating Stars by Mary Robinette Cole. And this one is science fiction. It is an alternate history. So in the year 1952, an asteroid hits the Earth and obliterates most of the East Coast. So this is like an extinction level event, much like the asteroid that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. So it causes 
climate change that is rapidly making the world unlivable. So the human response to that is to accelerate the space program. We've got to get ourselves off the planet, right? And because of the radical acceleration of that program, they needed to pull in like everyone. So everyone who can do math, who can do engineering, who can do any of that stuff is working for the space program. So um, we have, it's actually the first book in a series called The Lady Astronauts. So you can see all of the silhouettes of our ladies there. So we've got, um, you know, female WASP pilots from World War II and um, scientists and mathematicians who are all working towards the space program and um, working towards becoming astronauts themselves, which is pretty cool. So this one has been on my list for a while, and um, this is going to be my kick in the pants to actually read it. Sounds good. Yeah, I'm excited about that one. Cool. So our last pair is one that I have read one of the books, and Claire has read the other one. Did I'm you hoping. forget about this part? Yeah, I sure did. <laughs> um, well, I'm I'm apparently springing things on. <laughs> oh no, I remember the book now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Northern Spy. Yeah. So the nonfiction one is one I've talked about before. Say nothing: a true story of murder and memory in Northern Ireland about the Troubles. Um, so this is Patrick Radden Keefe. His new book out, or newer book out, is Empire of Pain, about the Sackler family and the opi opioid crisis. Um, but this one was fascinating and really got into um, the IRA and um, the disappearances that they caused during the Troubles. And A Northern Spy... I can't remember now who wrote the book because I don't have the book in front of me. Well, you gave it away, I think. Yeah. 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 But anyway. um, actually, it, it really works pretty well with that book because it's about two sisters, one of whom does disappear, and the other sister is left looking for her. Flynn and then Barry. Flynn Berry? Flynn Berry, right. yes, yes. Our nameless voice just... <laughs> Our producer, Sean. Our producer just <laughs> gave me that fun fact. So um, anyway, she leaves behind a young child, and she's trying to find what happened to her and then finds out she was involved with the IRA. So she, she like kind of goes undercover or has someone that's like a mole and doesn't know who to trust and yeah. It, it was good. So. Nice. so that was our surprise lightning round. <laughs> yes. Because um, Claire forgot. Sorry. Yeah, well, and I didn't remind you either. Yeah. Um, so those are the pairs that we've got. Um, we would love to hear from more of you if you're participating in the challenge. Or even if you're not, if you have an idea for some books that would pair well together, please let us know. Um, we do have a display in the front of the library where we have some prepared books um, that you can check out as is if you need some help getting started. Um, and we could always use help replenishing that display. So if you have a pair that you've got in mind, let us know. And our next one, are we going to do books that we broke up with? Mm hmm. Yes, we are. Okay. <laughs> so our next episode will be in about two weeks, and it'll be, I think, right after Valentine's Day. And we are going to talk about books that we broke up with. Yeah. I'm excited about that one. Yeah, Sometimes you got to let the bad ones go. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll be talking about that and, you know, why we stop reading books, like why we break up with a book. So. And why there's no shame in that. No, none whatsoever. Life is too short. That's right. Too many good books to read, too little time. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So thank you, everyone. Um, we will see you in a couple of weeks. And again, please leave in the comments any books that you're reading or suggestions for pairs. All right. We'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.